right, we are recording now. So just so everyone's aware, we are recording this. Hopefully that's okay with everyone. Keep your mic off, keep your video off. And I think we're gonna go through the through the presentation. If you have questions, uh, just type them into the chat, um, you know, as you go along. If it's something that we think can be answered in the time, then we'll do it then. If it's something that should wait till the end, we'll just wait till the end, but we'll see how it goes. I think we got a bunch of uh, new signups from uh, John's presentation today. He was presenting with Neuralite, and I think he gave a little bit of a plug to us. So if that's where you found that's out, that'd be great. Thank you for joining us. A little bit different than his talk today. I think he was talking about um, roofing, weatherproofing. Might have been also air tightness. You never know. Can't. I don't. I didn't actually watch it, so. All the things that Europe Light provides in one packet. Yeah. Weatherproof. Yeah, like this vapor control insulation. <laughs> exactly. All the things. All the things. All the good things. Mm hmm Couple more minutes. What do you reckon? Yeah. Couple more minutes just to give people some time. Get yourself a cup of tea or a coffee. Yeah. If you have any, uh, if you have any questions already, feel very free to type them into the chat. We can kind of just start talking about those things. I apologize for my sniffly nose. It's uh, it's allergy season, and I am quite allergic. Lots of hay you fever. You know what? You need some proper filters and a yeah. ventilation system. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh, I, I do need those things. Just. Uh, Reminds me that I didn't talk about filters. I did have a, <laughs> yeah, hey, we talk a about moment it. of, uh, yeah, yesterday I was like, oh, I need to put the filters in the ventilation presentation, mm. but I forgot about it. But I've got um, I've got the standards open here so we can maybe That's... talk or touch on them towards the end. That's fair. That's fair. Love a good filter, some filtered air. You want fresh air, but it also should be filtered for, for my sake, because I sneeze when it's not. All the dust and all the all the pollen. <clears throat> should we just crack in? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, let's do let's it. Let's get started. All right, friends. Well, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. I'm oh, we got one. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's crack in. So I'm Peter. That's Denise. We're talking about some Hi, heating. Everyone. Our last uh, our last presentation was on air tightness, and now it kind of moves into the heating and ventilation, which is becomes much more necessary when you have a good air tightness. So let's uh, do that. Yeah. As uh, as we went through last time, I'm not sure if if everyone was here for the last presentation, but uh, we talked about different terms because there's a lot of terms that kind of sound the same, but they are a little bit different. But generally what you can remember is ventilation is the air movement that you want to move and infiltration is the air movement that's uncontrolled and you don't necessarily want it moving because, um, you know, ventilation is good for fresh air, but infiltration means that it's coming through cracks and holes and maybe through your insulation, maybe taking dust with it. And it's just uncontrolled airflow that isn't necessarily clean or anything like that. It also carries energy and moisture with it, which are both things that you don't necessarily want. So, yeah, I don't think we'll go th through all of them again. Everyone has had time to read these while I was speaking, I think. So I'll just go to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some more some more people coming in. So maybe we should have waited till the five minutes. But anyways, welcome uh, to our our stragglers here. Make sure your uh, your videos off, mics off. If you have questions, just toss them into the, the chat tab there. And if, uh, if we can answer them as we're going along, we'll do that. If not, then we'll wait till the end. But uh, yeah. So yeah, just a little recap, and we'll get into comfort and health, indoor air quality, and I'll let Denise take that one. Sounds good. Thanks, Peter. No problem. So I think, you know, the, um, the overall, the overall um, goal of the discussion should always be, you know, health and comfort. So we should talk about the indoor air quality um, parameters that we're actually trying to achieve with ventilation. 
um, and there are two comfort um, standards out there that um, are called ASHRAE 55 and an ISO 7792. Don't call yeah. me on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they it's both uh, specify sort of a range of what, what people perceive as comfortable because um, obviously comfort is a very individual um, perception. Some people like it, you know, a bit colder, some like it a bit warmer. It depends on age and, you know, how much, um, how active you are, how much clothing you're wearing and so on. Um, and so these are, however, the sort of width or ranges of uh, comfort or human comfort that we can actually quantify. Things like room ear temperature, um, the actual surface temperature on surfaces inside the building and uh, perhaps the differences in there, um, relative humidity of our indoor ear, the ear speed at which our ear is being moved around, um, obviously um, uh, air quality is in carbon dioxide or VOCs and formaldehydes um, and such and uh, general odors and obviously the noise um, in, in this case, obviously related to ventilation, um, ear speed or fans, um, but just in general, noise is um, also part of the discussion here. So, yeah. I think yeah. It's, yeah. it's interesting because like you mentioned, uh, some people have different perceptions of what's warm and what's cold, but you'll find if you actually test it out, if you have your relative humidity in and around that 50%, 55%, between that 40 to 60 range, then you'll find that you're most comfortable between that 20 to 23. You might go down to 18 when you're sleeping because you like a little bit of a, like a cold pillow or something like that, but it's not gonna be any lower than that 18 and it's probably not gonna be any higher than that 26. You'll, you'll definitely be comfortable in there. And uh, yeah, these, these are studies that have been done over many years with a lot of smart people that know a lot of smart things. So. Just trust, just trust. It's somewhere within there. Um, exactly. Why ventilate, Denise? Why do we got to ventilate? Who's who's forcing us to ventilate? Well, first of first of all, we need to control our humidity um, because we are generating <clears throat> quite a bit of moisture inside our houses. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about um, how much moisture can actually diffuse out of our building fabric, um, it's actually just about up to three percent that you know, can actually move through your building uh, construction systems and the rest we actually need to deal with um, by means of ventilation. So yeah. the good thing is though, if it's warmer inside than it is outside, then the ear can generally carry a bit more moisture. Um, so you don't get condensation so easily as in colder rooms. Um, but the metrics that we have found in and around our ventilation standard G4 um, are in this table here. So we've got the acceptable solutions that um, talks about the, um, an air change of 0 0.35 of your total ventilation volume or your total interior volume. So that's not just for one room. You know, like sometimes we have these weird standards where heating is just specified for one room. <laughs> mm -hmm. This ear change rate applies to the whole of your living space. So if you've got a house, then that includes all the um, living bathroom, kitchen, bedrooms, and so on. Um, and it's not just for volume. Yeah, it's not just for the living room volume. So that applies to the whole yeah. of it. So that's then, 0 0.3 air changes per minute. So that's every three minutes you have a full air change? No, that's every or minimum. Every every three hours approximately. So gotcha. one air change per hour means that all of the volume in your yeah. house is being exchanged over the course of one hour. So yeah. you divide that by approximately three here. <laughs> so that means every three hours you have um, your air volume exchanged. Yeah. And then for and G4, then we dug into oh sorry G4 PM1 uh, the verification method which is uh, referencing um, a SIPSI uh, document. I do have to say that I don't have the oh. most recent version on file. Um, I doubt that there will be uh, massive differences between it. But just for reference, is um, 
an ear change for individual rooms. So talking about here, I've got it. I've got it open on the um, on my other screen here as well. So we're talking about 0.4 ear changes for bead in living area. That's for moisture control specifically. Um, funny enough, they're talking about five ear changes for toilets and larger than five, which could be a bit excessive. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I was assuming that that's just because for a shower, they're trying to really overdo it, make sure that as much, much moisture comes out as possible. Um, but yeah, then we have Passive House, which is a little bit closer to AS1, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, it's that 0.3. And that's, yeah. is that just the, the baseline minimum and you can go over that? Or is that a number that you have to meet exactly? Well, that is the minimum number you have to meet for passive house certification. Um, but that's also um, prescribed in the DIN standard that I uh, mentioned here. So yeah. there's a separate calculation that depending on the moisture generation rate inside a building, um, there has to be a minimum air exchange. So um, technically you would have to do the, the calculation based on the actual building uh, you're, you're doing. But in general, because uh, PHPP is now being used as a verification tool for Homestar, and it's also a verification tool now for H1 for the modeling method. Mm -hmm. So we'll stick to the 0 0.3 and uh, assume that we will work out more details in the next coming years. Yeah, as as MB starts to kind of tighten that up, because they've already said they're like, I asked them a question when I was at the Boeing conference, and uh, they were saying that by 2025, 2026 is when they'll start to wrap everything together. I hope they, you know, that's a really conservative estimate, and they get to it a little bit quicker. But we had a question come in from uh, Rahul uh, and said, how can we control humidity through ventilation if it's really humid outside? Uh, for example, 100% 100, uh, 100 relative humidity. Well, the thing is with relative humidity, it's all relative to the temperature. And so um, right now uh, I'm looking outside and it's it's raining outside in Auckland. So it's about 100% relative humidity outside. Um, and the key is warming up that air as it comes in. So if you have outside air at 100% relative humidity and it's, um, you know, uh, let's say degrees. 15 degrees, 13 degrees, whatever it is, if you warm it up, you reduce that relative humidity. And as you bring in air and as you warm it up and then as you exhaust it and then keep on doing that cycle, you eventually dry things out because uh, the heat absorbs a little bit more of that moisture and then you exhaust it, you bring some more in and it kind of just dries out like that. So, yeah. And uh, Janice, just to re um, repeat what you were saying at the beginning, not a lot of moisture will diffuse out through a very airtight building envelope, even if it's a very uh, vapor permeable building envelope, that vapor permeability is more for drying out interstitial moisture. It's not really specifically to get rid of all of your breathing, showering, cooking moisture. Um, but um, if you build like you build in Europe and it's all clay, clay speed tiles with plaster on it, then that absorbs a little bit more moisture. But that's not really how we build here in New Zealand. So yeah, and so like we said, you know, it's all it's all dependent on the humidity, uh, yeah. the relative humidity with the temperatures as well. And while in Auckland, you've got the risk with higher external humidity already. Yeah. Um, it you know, down here, for example, we would have the opposite. So here in Queenstown, if we were, you know, heating our winter ear, which is already quite dry, then we're drying the air out even more and it becomes yeah. really quite uncomfortable for humans. So yeah. it's yeah, obviously quite climate dependent. Um, but as a rule of thumb, um, you know, since it's prescribed in G4 as well as in the passive house uh, planner, 0 0.3 air changes or 0 0.35 is a pretty good target. Someone yeah. else joining? Someone else joining, but we'll go on to the next one. So indoor air quality for occupants. So I mean, moisture, getting rid of that is one very important thing. And then the next one is just being able to breathe, having good amount of uh, a good amount of oxygen. Um, so yeah, sufficient fresh air is the key. And I'll let you take these because you you did the research on these, uh, the AS1, VM1 and Passive House. They all seem somewhat close to each other, but also not really that close to each other. I wonder what the difference is. Sorry, I just got a call here on the other side that came up in my headphones. <laughs> ah, I see, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so... The, so uh, 
supply air rates according to our standards and sort of compared to passive fares as well. Also, G4 and passive fares being really close together. And mm -hmm. that is um, the supply air volumes that we're talking about. They're um, based on, you know, a certain quality of outdoor air um, and sort of human fresh air requirement for standard human metabolism. Yeah, and the and the state like the the value there is parts per million of uh, of CO two in the air. Is that is that what the what you're talking about? Yeah, there's a there's a couple of um, of uh, indoor air quality metrics that I think we're showing in one of the next slides yeah. that sort of correspond with that. Yeah. Um, but generally, but, yeah, it's interesting. You're... I was going to say it's interesting that AS one is actually pretty close to the meters cubed per hour um, that you see in in passive house, but with the VM one, um, it's much higher for some reason. Oh, it's specifically just for bathroom and yeah, for kitchen. Exactly. So there it is, um, just prescribed for for rooms and not necessarily yeah. for people. Yeah, this is per person, and that's also this is per person, thirty meters cubed per hour per person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting that it's pretty close there. And then we have this. It's probably a little bit difficult to see, um, but you have the yeah. current Australian guidelines up here, the European guidelines, and then NZS four three zero three, which is referenced. Um, in yeah, so here, um, unfortunately, it is a bit small, but we couldn't have fit the whole table in there. So these yeah. are the metrics for indoor air quality. And thank God, I finally found them in the New Zealand standards because yeah. I was a bit worried that uh -huh. we had no such thing as indoor air quality <laughs> thresholds. So um, this is where we're talking about, you know, the maximum allowance for CO2 levels, like the parts per million, um, yeah. carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, um, nitrogen oxide ozone yeah uh, particles what else have we got here special Beals. mention for rotorua um yep. sulfur <laughs> down there yeah the and, so and, um, uh, because because it because nz is 4303 is referencing um tables from 1984 they're still um was a Claudine in there, which is yeah. a pesticide that has been banned in the US in 1988. So but it's still there. Um, we can see our NZS standard probably needs a bit of an update as well. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see um, over here, it's interesting that you got the Australian guidelines. And let's just specifically talk about CO2, which is that um, averaging time eight hours, maximum air quality value is 850 parts per million. And that matches the European guidelines as well. And then you target below 1000, you try to target below 800 target average, you have all these targets. Whereas the New Zealand one, it says averaging time is continuous and uh, 1000 is the comfort level. And then up to 3,500 is the acceptable exposure range, which is way higher than the European guidelines and higher than the Australian. So it's, yeah, need a little bit of update, but you found this in the CIBSE guide A, which is what's referenced. If, if you go through the, the code, the code has, you know, the things that you're supposed to do, and then it references other standards. And this is one of the ones that it references. I had to pay for a whole membership to get this, because um, it's not like it's just in the code. Um, but anyways, we found it and, uh, yeah, this kind of seems a little bit more reasonable. It's a bit more like it. Yeah. So yeah. it's classified into different indoor air quality levels. So IDA one to IDA four, yeah. um, with, you know, a range from 700 to 1600, uh, mm -hmm. particles per million, um, still a bit high at the, you know, at the upper range. But um, also the problem that you get is when you when you select a verification method, which one are you going for? Mm. Because it's not really a unified approach. Like we would think that the SIPS guide is um, definitely more up to date than the uh, tables from NZS 4303. But then we can see that, you know, the acceptable solutions is a bit closer in terms of ear change rate and ear supply yeah. for the occupants. Um, so it's a bit of a conflict here and it would be quite helpful if, um, yeah. you know, we could help. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the, the general thing is, 
I think the, the, the general thing is we should be aiming for that 1600 or below at least, but in and around the thousand would be better. But yeah, 3,500, that's just, I think they've just left that in being like, yeah, that's fine. I, I guess if people don't open <laughs> their windows, right. but the thing is over, over 1500, over, over 1700, you already start to feel a little bit sluggish and that's what you need. That's why you need the fresh air. That's why you need the high oxygen content, because if it's too high in CO2, you just start to get tired. You're not thinking as as straight. Um, there has been studies um, for school kids where if they have higher levels of CO2 in the classroom, they do more poorly. They do worse on their on their exams than, you know, kids that are in a, uh, a more oxygenated environment. So that's really the whole reason there. But um, ventilation strategies. Yeah. You might want to add that you know like these uh these sort of points or metrics that we're referring to are all based on actual studies that have been done over the last 60 years in terms yeah. of air quality so they are they are there um it's actually mm -hmm. not that difficult to reference them um a bit more uniformly or even just copy the australian ones that are sort yeah. of up to date yeah. Um, and make that the metric for AS1 and VM1. Yeah, fingers crossed that they that MB does that change at some point. But you can still right now follow that. And if you have mechanical ventilation, you can get good air quality. And you can actually have there's um, the sensors from Tether, but there's other sensors that you can purchase as well that they they count. You know the temperature the relative humidity and the pressure and the co2 content they can also check vocs and all you have to do is you put it on the wall and then it sends it to your phone it says uh says what's going on um but yeah ventilation strategies there's two general ways there's natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation um i'm i'm of the of the belief that you cannot use i mean like you can use natural ventilation but it doesn't really work very well um there are some buildings in the world um that have been designed to actually actively take you know take natural ventilation and make it work but just having windows that open that's not proper natural ventilation that's not properly using stack effects it's not properly using actual pressures to make air go through the go through the building um because like, you can use crack ventilation which is infiltration which is like we said not what you want it's uh it's uncontrolled airflow it carries energy with it it carries moisture with it it it's not doing the thing that you want it to do there's window ventilation which can be made to work there are some buildings in the world if you want to look up the manitoba hydro building that one has a lot of cool automatic opening windows and shades that open up and a solar chimney and a massive atrium. And so that works with natural ventilation in minus 40 and plus 40, but generally just having a window that is able to be opened, that's not proper ventilation. Um, well, also imagine the uh, dynamic modeling that would have to go into designing uh, something like this. Yeah, it a lot. It seems very seems very excessive um, yeah uh, especially when we can look at the actual you know energy efficiency of running ventilation fans it's not yeah really that it costly. needs a lot of modeling but also commissioning like it took them two years to fully commission that building so that it was able to run by itself um yeah. because you have to keep on tweaking everything to make sure it all works because you can model it but you know once it uh once it's actually built you have to do it so shaft ventilation is that um when you just have like a tube in the it's ceiling like a stack ventilation yeah yeah it but like we, we, we show it in the next slide sort of yeah. approximately what that what that means green star Wait. experts amongst our um audience might totally understand how that all works with the yeah. central atrium <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, fair. Um, but yeah, mechanical ventilation, it could be extract, it could be supplier, it could be balanced. Um, generally, I lean more towards extract because if you have supply ventilation, you have the chance of pressurizing your building and pushing moisture into places it doesn't want to be in a warming climate or sorry, a heating climate like here in New Zealand. But hang but, on, if you've got oh, extract ventilation only, then yeah. you're creating negative pressure and you've got more infiltration again. So you have more pollutants coming through. I, I prefer the extract though, just because if you have if you have a building that is warm on the inside and cold on the outside, if you take the relatively moist air here and push it into the walls, you have a chance of condensation. Whereas if you have infiltration coming in, it's warming up as it comes in and it stays drier. So it's not good. Let's just I, agree on balanced ventilation. Yeah, let's just agree on balanced because it's just better. <laughs> um, and yeah, paired with the correct building permeability, it's. Um, 
once you start to get to a more um, airtight building, you really need um, continuous me mechanical ventilation balanced with heat recovery. Um, you can kind of get away with background ventilation, exhaust ventilation, et cetera, if you have a kind of a leaky building, um, leaky in terms of air, not in terms of water. Um, but generally, you can still put your, your continuous mechanical ventilation with heat recovery in an air leaky building and it'll work. And as you make it more and more airtight, it'll just work better and better, more efficiently. So yeah, on to the next one. So let's talk about yeah, natural. Well, basically just, yeah, just explaining what that sort of means with natural ventilation. Yeah. Um, but like you said, it's like window opening on one side or two sides or more sides. And you're hoping for the wind and the temperature difference to do their work. Yeah. And mostly you're hoping that the temperature outside is a good temperature that you want to bring inside. Because in the winter, I don't want to have my windows open, but maybe some people do. I, I don't know. Maybe they like the, <laughs> the icy cold temperature. Well, to be, to be fair, Ooh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, we do have sort of natural ventilation um, mm. calculation methods. And that is uh, temperature driven usually or based on average wind speed. But you mm. say like in winter, you should be opening your windows and doors for up to five minutes per hour to get that yeah. air exchange. Um, and in summer up to 10 minutes per hour. So and this sort of based on Germany's climate data. So in New Zealand, that would probably mean, you know, 15 minutes in summer and uh, 10 minutes in winter in Queenstown, effectively, but who gets up at night? And so, <laughs> yeah, and, and doors and no, windows. The thing is, though, in Germany, um, a lot of times, and I want to say most of the time, there's a radiator under each window. And so, if you have it, you know, you're in your bedroom, you crack open the window a little bit, the radiator heats up that like, air coming in. Like, like right this. there. She's got it right behind her. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Technology from Germany's here. But yeah, Welcome if to you have Germany. that. Yeah, you have your air naturally coming in there, but it's being heated up as it comes in. So it's being dried out and it's also not not as uncomfortable. So if you have that in your New Zealand house and you want to use your windows, then great. But if you just have like a typical New Zealand house that just has no heating at all, not very comfortable in the winter. Um, and then there's also stack ventilation, which does technically work, but you need a fairly tall building and you need a connected, some sort of shaft in the middle, an atrium, a an elevator shaft, something along those lines to make it work. And so if the temperature inside is warmer than outside, so this is like a winter type scenario, you have um, air coming in, heating up and then exiting out because of the pressure. Um, and then in the summer, if you're air conditioning on the inside, then it'll be the opposite. It'll come in from the top and go out the bottom. But yeah, it kind of works, but you kind of need a tall building and you have to you have to make it work. You have to design it to work. You have to model it to work. Yeah. Not just going to match. Such an individual process for each building, you know, and then yeah. you're, you're designing this for something in the middle of the city and the environment around it changes, you know, you get taller buildings or neighbors and things like that. And all of this affects, you know, how the wind is actually um, getting onto your building and creating like these pressure differences that make the whole thing work. You mm. can see in the, in the little graphs here, um, that's sort of just an overview of how yeah. the wind pressures actually work around your building so yeah. you're always at the mercy of either wind or temperature yeah. so it's a bit it's, it's, yeah it's a way but it's not the best way <laughs> it's not the most effective way um trickle vents i oh, we had to we had to give it a separate a separate couple of slides <laughs> because trickle yeah. vents is like the bane of our ventilation yeah. existence <laughs> yeah because you say oh well you can't use windows to ventilate because people aren't going to open them in the winter and someone immediately says pipes up and says hey what about trickle vents and it's like okay it's the it's literally the same concept it's just like having a window um oops i keep on pressing things it's actually having on. having like a, a permanent opening in the wall um, correct so according to um our acceptable solutions we could have yeah. you know either either two holes one in the top half of the wall and one in the bottom half of the wall you guys. that are about the size of uh, or squares like 45 mil on each side mm -hmm. but they should be located to minimize drafts sure 
but if Aren't you're supposed you, to cause draft <laughs> you're supposed to bring the air in and the wind is supposed to draft in so it's like how do you stop that okay so you let's let's say hypothetically you figure that out and you figure out how to make the drafts not happen you also need to have the openings be 2000 millimeters squared and so like you could just have a wide open hole but then rain comes in there birds come in there i don't know if, there's no raccoons here but in toronto there would be some raccoons coming in um but if you want to have them, you know, protect against bugs coming in, let's say um, rain and stuff like that, you have to have some sort of mesh, you have to have some sort of baffle, something like that. So you have to make a bigger hole than this just to make that, a that much happen. much bigger hole. So usually you have like a long the script. equivalent aerodynamic area. So whatever Correct. mesh you're putting on there, it has to increase proportionally to whatever you are not doing so you've got this massive hole in the wall that just gets bigger and bigger so the raccoons don't come yeah so you have to minimize drafts you have to secure it to keep pest and insects out oh my gosh i keep on doing that um you also have to have acoustic attenuation so you have to have like baffles in there or foam in there so that once again you have to keep on growing the size of this while also <laughs> minimizing drafts um, be controllable and closable in all conditioned spaces. So you have to go there and you have to open and close them whenever you want to do that. Um, and then they're installed in household units, providing they do not contain mechanical supply. I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe they want it not well, to exit, you, only to have, enter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's your only means of ventilation here. Um, yeah. Yes. And so, I mean, it just... it hey if you really want to use trickle vents you can do it if you have continuous extract ventilation so you have an extract fan constantly working and constantly pulling air through those those uh trickle vents but yeah. are they going to yeah, minimize right. drafts are they going to be are they going to be comfortable is it going to be really good you also don't get the filtering um nature of the air so like if you have allergies yeah. like i do you get all the pollen coming in it just they're just I, more i was wondering i was wondering whether that was um, somewhat designed to create, you know, this Kwanda effect when, you know, you've got like a, this opening uh, that is supposed to run along the ceiling and then slowly diffuse into the room while not creating um, Maybe. draft. But, Maybe. Um, but what tends to happen is that it's usually a strip right next to the window because that's the easiest place to put it and it just doesn't really work. And like I, I was in Ireland and they had some trickle vents in the walls and they were about the size of this, this one right here, this uh, individual one. And it had mm -hmm. a grate on it. And just like all night long, you could feel air just blowing through because it was winter time and it was just cold. So it's just, just don't use them. Just, just, just try not to, but either way. We actually took this even further. <laughs> yeah, we'll still, we'll still do the thought experiment just to see. <laughs> so like, so, According yeah. to the table, um, to get the minimum air supply for um, each of those scenarios per person, mm. uh, we've actually uh, converted these these openings into a best case scenario. So in Auckland, for example, we've got um, average wind speeds of about five meters a second. So we converted that airflow over the whole size into so you know like assuming the wind would be perfectly yeah. square so you got a four thousand four thousand millimeters square like this five mil, uh, meters per second air is blowing right yeah. through it that's the equivalent aerodynamic yeah. area this is how much air you get through there this is, exactly mm. and then um considering we have this perfect airflow through through this hole, what that would actually mean if we got to 0 0.35 air changes mm -hmm. in terms of what the floor area is that we could service within these holes, um, assuming the average ceiling height is like 2.5 meters. So I, I assume we could increase the floor areas if the ceilings were a bit lower. Um, sure. But we're looking at one person living on 10 10 uh, or seven to eight square meters. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, to, these are working perfect perfectly. Ventilation scenario. <laughs> yeah, these are working perfectly, trickle vents as good as possible, but then we're checking it against the verification method or against the acceptable solution on the other side of it to say, does this actually make sense? It makes sense if your house is only 10 square meters. Um, doesn't really. If you're living there as one person, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if you have two people, then you can get you can have twenty square meters, so that's fun. Yeah. Be a real tight fit, but you know, <laughs> but that's, that's the thing. It's just like it doesn't it. 
you can try with trickle vents, but they just don't actually work in reality. Not unless you kind of make them work. So yeah, types of mechanical ventilation, we already went through these, but extract is the one that I was mentioning. This is kind of standard in Canada. Um, for if, if you're not putting in balanced ventilation, then you can only use negative pressure. And I was I lived in an apartment building that had uh, kind of like an automatic humidity controlled extract. And so whenever the humidity was high, it would just turn on and it would be kind of in the background. So it works. It, it, it sucks air out and then air infiltrates in through your windows, through cracks, through under doors. Um, it's not ideal because it's it relies on infiltration, which is uncontrolled airflow. But because it's coming inwards, like I mentioned before, it's warming up and therefore you don't have that condensation risk that you would if you were pushing it out. So it's fine. It kind of works. It's not bad. And Homestar now allows it as one of their ventilation methods. So I mean, like it's, it's you know, it's not terrible, but it's not the best. Yeah, they also still allow trickle vents. So True. nobody's perfect. <laughs> but like mixing this with some trickle vents, that makes them work a little bit better because you're not relying on the wind anymore. You're actually relying on um on yeah. some, some, i mean let's right. face it uh there's always um a fraction of occupant behavior as well not everyone has their windows closed all year round not even in passive house there is always that factor as well but we're talking about you know the um the effectiveness of what we would call base ventilation because that should run automatically in the background and provide you with the humidity control that you need to operate your building at the most effective ways and i think that's where we need to make you know that distinction we're, we're talking about the absolute basic minimum that you need to achieve in your building and whatever you do on top of that whether you know you want it a bit colder um, and you want to open your windows more often that's all that's all fine but we're just sure. talking about the absolute minimum that yeah. your building should do in the background yeah, the, the set it and forget it kind of value instead of having to go around and open things and close things. So, yeah, then there's positive pressure, which is pretty typical in New Zealand. All of those three letter acronym ventilation, quote unquote, ventilation uh, providers. Uh, there's two, three, three acronym ones, three letter acronym ones that you know of. Um, and then a few other ones, and they just have basically a box in the uh, a box in the attic that sucks in attic air and shoves it in here. Um, the, that's actually not. Oh, hey, it's actually right down there. Um, this it's actually not. Oh, yeah, without promoting without promoting specific brands, but you know these systems are available, and we can probably yeah. agree. Attic, attic but is not fresh air. It's, yeah. it's not fresh air, and technically, they don't make your building comply with G four, which is the ventilation portion of the code. The thing that makes you comply with G four is your windows that can open. And then this also just provides extra air and people love them. They're like, oh my gosh, my windows are now dry because any ventilation is better than no ventilation. So if you have dead still air, then yeah, you'll see condensation. And if you start packing more air into the house, there's more air to absorb that moisture. So it does help, but it's attic air. It's kind of dusty. They're pretty expensive for what they are. Um, you spend it like one extra thousand dollars over like these are five, six thousand dollars you spend six or seven thousand dollars you get a balanced ventilation si system with heat recovery that gives you exterior air much more oxygenated much less dusty it warms it up as it comes in as opposed to having cold drafty air from your attic being blown in in the winter so it just well let's let's all, boohoo all of this if you can buy it but connect it to the outside if you want to have outside air going through your house and down use your attic air is slightly better slightly better. And I feel like a lot of apartments are getting this treatment where there are some apartments that need to be ventilated uh, because you're not allowed to open the windows to ventilate because of noise outside. I think it's a uh, unitary plan concerns. But um, with those ones, usually they have like a switch on the wall to suck in the air and they usually have to put a heater on it to temper that air so that it's not ice cold so that, you know, the occupants actually want to use it. But if you have balanced ventilation with heat recovery, you don't have to put that extra heater because it's already being heated by the by the um the, the warm air that's escaping so anyways positive pressure i don't like it this is from our we have our our ventilation uh yeah we have our ventilation Just, uh resource on our website you can go look at it this is the one you want balance pressure no and so hang on not yeah. quite because this doesn't have heat recovery it's just ah, balanced so ah, we, we did uh 
we did um, separate the balance and balance with heat recovery I out see. of there. So okay. even this system would need like a, um, a heater within the ventilation system to actually heat up the air that's coming in. Um, yeah. You have some that connect to that to the heat pump. So instead of having a, a split unit on your wall, you have the heat pump in that box. And so it, it warms the air as it comes in. You reckon Thanks, that's a heat that. pump? Uh, I don't. I don't reckon that this specifically is a heat pump. I'm saying that there's some of them that yeah. that can It'll probably happen. just be like yeah. an electric heating coil in there, warming up the air that's going through. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we want to be cautious about um, introducing heat pumps in this discussion with ventilation, but we'll get to that. Uh, sure, fair, <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah, way. don't want to confuse anyone. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But either way, an, a ducted system that that warms up the whole house is good. Um, yeah, better than better than positive or negative ventilation because you're controlling the air, all the air that's coming in, all the air that's going out. You're controlling it all, which is good. Yeah. Um, Maybe also worth saying in that um, in that last slide that you know, sometimes or this this specific supplier has got um, systems that can transfer air from one room into the other. So these are just um, the air to actually provide more heating from one room into the other because um, you only have one yeah, heat source fire. in the in the room but this that's not a, a ventilation system as such so ventilation actually just means that you're getting outside air into your house um, green and funny green. enough those air transfer systems are usually uh, put in uh, into houses in combination with fireplaces mm. because like we discussed last time, uh, fireplaces, they're nice and warm around the fireplace, but they draw air from all the perimeter of the building, which makes the rest of the house really cold. And then you put in an air transfer system to try and heat up the it's like around, yeah. <laughs> kind of a um, the perimeter again cycle. that the fireplace is causing to be cold. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's yeah, a vicious, vicious cycle there. But yeah. here we go. That's the one. This is the want. one you want. Yeah. Yes. So, so heat you got recovery core. Yeah. It's like a recycling system of the existing temperature of your ear before it gets exhausted outside. It goes through like a, a coil um, in, in the core of the unit and transfers the heat into the fresh ear without having any exchange within the ear. So you Just get it preheated, and then you, depending on the uh, temperature or the design temperature, there's a little post heater that gives it that little extra boost. Um, super energy efficient. And the more energy efficient the rest of your house is, the better these work. But you can yeah. use them pretty much anywhere. And the key is here that it's constantly running and it runs very slow. It's not blowing a lot of air. And that's what's allowing that heat to transfer. It goes through kind of like a honeycomb type thing. The exhaust air is going this way. The incoming air is going that way and it transfers heat. And this is like a massive unit that would be in, you know, a hotel distributed with a bunch of um, ducts or something like that. But you can also get really small ones for apartments that fit just above your, your range hood in a closet. Um, above your laundry machine even. They're, they're pretty small, compact little things and you just have to duct them um, to the exterior and to the interior um, and they work pretty well. Um, they're in and around the, if you want a really cheap one, like a thousand dollars, but they're pretty cheap. Um, and then something like this is in and around like the five or six thousand for a for an apartment, which is pretty good because it's about comparable with a heat pump. Um, and then there's also through wall systems, they're decentralized. And so you have multiple of these that have a hole in the wall. You have one there, you have one there, you have one there, you have one there, you have one there. They all talk to each other. And as one is blowing out, the other one's blowing in. As one is blowing in, the other one's blowing out. And it saves heat in this core. So it just goes out, warming up this core, and then comes in, which warms up the air coming in, goes out to warm up the core, comes and comes back in. It kind of just breathes back and forth. And those ones are pretty cost effective. They're like, you know, a few hundred bucks kind of thing. And you can put a few yeah, of them in there. Depending on the brand or the sure. type, uh, some of sure. those are more um, efficient than others. But unless you want a passive house type system, um, there's there's lots of good ones in the market. They'll do the yeah. job for, for any sort of house. Yeah. And they don't require an attic space, an underfloor space, anything like that, because you just cut a hole in the wall and then yeah. Yeah, put them there. You can replace yeah. your trickle vent with them. And it works a lot better. <laughs> yeah, it's about uh, the same size hole. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically, honestly, yeah. 
Um, but anyways, ventilation, energy efficiency, like it, it you can get a lot yeah, more. So how we, yeah, so how we actually calculate the efficiency of ventilation mm -hmm. uh, systems. So we're looking obviously at the ventilation ear change. So mm -hmm. how many times do we need to actually change the ear out in the building? And so that's the with each with each cubic meter of air that we're exchanging, we have to add heating or cooling to that. So that is a part of our energy efficiency. So you're trying to obviously minimize the um, the air change that you get throughout the um, throughout the building with your yeah. ventilation system, in order to maximize your energy efficiency. Yeah, so and we've seen we've seen ventilation designs where you know, or like is in, in the verification method where they're recommending five ear, up to five ear changes, ventilation ear changes. That's obviously yeah. highly inefficient. Um, yeah. So you're trying to stay somewhere around that range um, yeah. for winter anyway. Somewhere can be a bit higher because we don't actually need to heat as much. And like we said uh, earlier, if the airflow is a little bit higher during summer, it makes us actually feel more comfortable especially with, with um, you know, climate yeah. change and it's like changing. having a fan on kind of blows the yeah. air around and kind of cools off your skin. But yeah, you want to get just enough ventilation air change that people have are well oxygenated. You have no smells and stuff like that, but you don't want to go too much because you're just losing extra energy. So the other one is infiltration yeah. air changes. And so that so, is um, based on, that's right. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, if you were listening um, to our presentation last month, where we're talking about ear tightness. So your infiltration ear change is a combination of um, the natural infiltration in your building, or if you know what a blower door test is, um, the um, the actual building um, under an artificial pressure difference. And uh, we showed in a couple of graphs that you can actually save 30 to 35% with a more airtight building. And while you're ventilating already with a balanced system of heat recovery, you might as well make the house really airtight. Um, so you can save uh, a solid 30% yeah. of your current power bill just, just like that. You get less energy just escaping out through cracks and and holes and things like that. If you have trickle vents, you're just losing. You're just pouring money out the trickle vent. It's just money. Go away. Exactly. Bye. See you later. Um, but then when you have your heat recovery efficiency, that is based on your ventilation air change, how much air changes per hour, and then how good it is at recovering efficiency. Because if you're recovering the heat from the air going out, then you don't have to put it in with a heater because it's just doing that same thing it's coming back in so you can get what's yeah. what's a good what's a good efficiency on a on a key recovery uh, i think i think a lot of systems uh, even even the bad ones in themselves will have an efficiency rate of 50 percent as such for passive house uh, type buildings the um, unit itself needs to have a minimum efficiency of 75 percent Hmm. Um, heat recovery, but you can get um, other systems that have efficiencies of over ninety percent. So, um, yeah, it's actually it's actually quite good. What so you basically, recover, if you have if you recover, yeah. So if you have your ventilation air change, you have your fans which are using electric efficiency to blow the air out, and then you're recovering ninety percent of that efficiency. Then you only have to put ten percent of heat back in, as uh, with with the, with the heater itself. So. Yeah. And then yeah. these um, heat recovery systems usually just run on a fan. So all that basically takes in terms of actual power to operate the system is the fan running 24 seven. And it's like the fan doesn't really cost that much to run. Like uh, if you go back into the slide, I think um, most systems would be able you One kilowatt. Uh, most, yeah, there. most systems would be able to move at least two thousand cubic meters for one kilowatt hour. So you know that's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of uh, fan. Yeah, the reason I was time. I was coming back here is just like yeah. this. It looks really complicated because it's got this diamondy thing, but really all it is is two fans: one to push air out, one to push air in. That's all it does. That's, those are the only moving parts in there. This thing is just a block that that allows heat transfer. So. I'll, if a lot of people say that, oh, if I have a, a passive house, what if I open the doors and windows? Am I going to lose all that efficiency? And it's like, not really. The fan hardly uses any electricity. It's just like it's just blowing air around and, you know, opening and closing 
affects that efficiency a little bit, but if it's comfortable outside, then it doesn't affect it at all because at least you're comfortable and it's just still running at the exact same speed. So, yeah. Oh, look at that. All the animations have disappeared. There was animations. I had this all, I had this all animated. Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, too late. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> I'll, click, I'll click through. Yeah, just, uh, click, just click all of them um, and then we'll just talk through it. Sure. All right. I think that's so, the um, okay. so if we take this G4 standard, um, I just made up a very simplified um, approach to how you actually do ventilation design for your specific project. So I've used the floor plans of my house, um, which I'm sitting in. These are the floor plans. <laughs> where, where are you sitting? And, You're sitting right here? Um, yeah. You see the table there? Yeah, that's yeah. the table here. <laughs> Got it. Cool. Now we see where we're at. Um, and that you know, orientated yourself inside yep. my house. Great. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So um, we split it into obviously the areas where um, we need to extract air, which is the bathrooms and the kitchens. So yeah, I've highlighted bathroom. them in, in orange here. Yeah. Bath, so bath, according kitchen. to G4, we need to extract uh, 10 liters per second continuous in bathrooms in 12 liters per second uh, in, in kitchen areas continuous, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which equates to those cubic meters per hours. Um, and I've calculated the uh, reference area as well for each of those rooms. So that's a total extract um, of 115.2 uh, cubic meters per hour mm -hmm. of a my area of 24 square meters in those three rooms. Now, the blue areas would be um, what we use as a baseline for calculating the supply air. So the code says that for the first bedroom, you allow for two people. And for any additional bedroom, you have to add one more person to it. So 27 cubic meters per hour per person or 7.5 liters continuous supply adds up to 108 cubic meters per hour, mm -hmm. um, which is not that far away from our extract minimum. Pretty so close. Obviously, we do need to meet the, you know, the highest requirement. So, so that's your number. if we had one more person in there, then our supply air would exceed the extract air requirement. And then we would have to go with that as a minimum. In this case, mm -hmm. the extract air requirement exceeds our fresh air supply. So technically, we would need to add, was it seven, seven more cubic meters or 6.8 cubic meters uh, in order to balance that out with um, the supply air. 15.2, yep. Yeah. And when I calculate, you know, the, um, or break that down, 115.2 cubic meters over the total volume of my house, um, say I've calculated all the areas times uh, 2.5 meter ceiling height, which um, adds up to 307 something cubic meters, mm -hmm. um, I get a total air exchange of 0 0.375. Which is pretty much what you were looking for. Which is zero point three five is the minimum. Zero point three five is the minimum. Yeah. I'm meeting the extract requirement and I'm meeting the, the supply the air requirement. Yeah, both at the same time. So that's basically all there is to it. Um, that's basically all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just make sure you have enough. And that's how. Sorry, I keep on <laughs> flipping through. Yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. What we would, uh, if you go back there, Peter, oh, so sorry. what we would do um, that might be um, more towards passive house and which we would recommend in general is that you also have a bit of a supply into your living spaces and not just into the bedrooms um, in order so you... to minimize sort of the drafts in between. So obviously the extract requirements in the bathrooms and kitchens are relatively high. So mm. spreading your ear supply will allow for um, a nicer transfer of ear in, yeah. in the green areas. Because the way that it kind of works is that the bath is extracting. And so if you have supply into the bedroom, that air would have to go through this door, through this door to get back out again to, 
you know, do the circle, do the loop, basically goes around like that. Exactly. So are you just putting another vent into the hall here just to kind of balance the pressures a little bit to prevent that airflow? Or slow it down, I guess. Uh, I would, I would actually do it downstairs into the into the living spaces. Got it. Yeah, fair. And then use the hall and entry area as a transfer area. Yeah. So when you when you get a balanced design, um, or when you when you want to buy a balanced design, usually the supplier will um, provide a design for you because obviously you need to duct that depending sure. on whether you use a central system or not and, that's and, job. Um, and it's their that's their job but yeah. this is uh, the basics of how to how that calculation is done it gets yeah. a bit more complicated with you know airflow um adjustments sure. and things like that yeah but and choosing the right ducts that. and the right uh the right diffusers and things like that but yeah. Anyways, uh, just because we're we're getting towards the end over here, we got four minutes left in our a lot of time, but we might go slightly over. Um, yeah, heating systems, heat pumps. Those are heat pumps are very efficient because they um, get you know efficiency of, of like four to one kind of thing depends on how efficient they are. Whereas you know uh, a heater like the one that's running in my house over here is just a little hot coil resistance heater. You get maximum one one-to-one -one, uh, energy input to energy heat output. Um, yeah, so so we're, um, I put I put in uh, some other heating systems here as mm. well, but just to make a cut here, like we um, spoke about ventilation systems and now we're talking about heating systems and heat pumps are not ventilation systems. They so are not. They don't move any air from the outside to the inside or mm -hmm. from the inside to the outside. All they do is um, they a very heat. technical thing with refrigerants and extract heat um, and put that into the other side of the yeah. heat pump. Basically, basically, you have a, a fan on this side, you have a fan on that side, this one cycles the air here, this one cycles the air there. The air is separate. They do not transfer. No air goes through these pipes. Only coolant goes through these pipes. And so... If you are putting in a heat pump thinking that, yeah, I'm getting ventilation, you're not. You're just moving the air around. And so you could have a filter in it, which would, you know, help me as an allergic person. Um, but it doesn't give you any fresh oxygenated air. It's just circulating the air that's inside. Um, so, yeah, that's all there is to it. Um, I think that's the, the whole point there. We just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that heat pumps do not provide ventilation. There are some heat pumps that you can buy that have ducts. They have a, a way of ventilating, but but nine nine ninety-nine percent of them are just you have the heat pump on the wall, you have your unit outside, they transfer um liquid between them. That's about basically it. This is my favorite type of heating. Oh my goodness. I love underfloor heating. Oh it's just it's the best. Also mm. in combination with one of those amazing um hot water heat pumps. Yeah. They're super efficient. Um and the best thing about this is it does heating and cooling. Mm. So you can have nice cool floors in the summer and nice warm floors in the winter. And it's just, oh, it's just, it's like, it's like having a hug on your feet <laughs> while walking around. And then you also get that warmth coming out to me. I'm not really describing it right, but just if you've never experienced heated just floors. Just radiant, just oh. radiant heat and consistent oh, so surface good. temperatures. So good. Uh, so good. It's like you don't know where the floor ends and your feet begin. It's just so wonderful. Anyways, that's uh, that's We're really, really suffering in this. In this yeah. Season. Anyways, um, got another comment in cooler air is perceived by people as fresh, but it's really just cool backwash. Yeah. Like if you're using it for air conditioning, it feels like, oh my gosh, fresh air, but it's not. It's just cold air. Um, and it's the same air that you just breathed in and out. So, yeah. Then heating systems, electric. Um, you can have the electric radiators. I have a, uh, a fan that has like a, a heating coil in it and a big high volume fan that works pretty well in my apartment, but you know, it's not that efficient. Yeah. These are, these are great. Like I love my, my heater. It's great mm. radiant heat. Um, it's not super efficient because the electric efficiency is like one to one. That's why heat pumps are so uh, popular because of the electric efficiency. So for each kilowatt hour electric, you get four kilowatt hours of heating um, yeah. out of, and, and that's why they're better than these electric ones. They make sense in passive houses, like my house wants to be one day. Yeah, um, <laughs> they don't use that much, but you can use, 
you could do, use this heat pump water heater to do the floor in floor heating and then also have your radiators like a hydronic radiator um pretty pretty typical in europe pretty typical in older houses in north, north america but yeah uh, so instead of just plugging this in you would have to then have a um like a yeah, plumbing, plumbing coil running around the house yeah. Other ones are heating systems, fire, log burners. We talked about these last time with our ventilation one. Um, you want to make sure it has a closed uh, face on it. You want it to be airtight. Um, it should have its own supply air coming in there um, so that you're not sucking air out of your house. Um, and ideally, it would have, you know, a fan in it that kind of sucks in some air through somewhere, puts it through some radiator coils, and then heats that air and then blows it around your house just to make it more efficient. Um, but if you're going with a, a passive house, putting a fireplace in your house is way too much heat. So like if you want a really yeah. efficient house and then also a fire, you can't really have both. Um, you might as well yeah. just put your fireplace you gotta, outside. You got to remember in a passive house, the heating demand is only 10 watts a square meter. So if you have a hundred square meter house, the total heating demand would be two kilowatts, which is a blow dryer or heat dryer. Yeah. Yeah. And out of those two kilowatts, you usually get 1.5 kilowatts just out of recycling your indoor heat with the heat recovery ventilation. Yeah. So um, you're ending up with a few hundred watts that you might have to add to the passive house in order to run it. Um, yeah. And you don't get um, a lock burner that only has a few hundred watts. Most of those start at five kilowatts yeah three usually kilowatts way too um, hot yeah like so a passive house a passive house you could do with a, a hair dryer but also i think uh 13 cats 13 and a half cats or something like that will heat up your house <laughs> um one cat per five square meters exactly yeah heating systems gas don't use these do not use this there are gas heaters. You can have a gas furnace that, you know, has a supply air and an exhaust and stuff like that. But an unflued gas heater is bad, 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 bad. It's bad because yeah, it has... Funny other... enough, when I, when I tried to look this up, um, the first article was uh, from One News. And it yeah. was, puts life and health at risk. <laughs> yeah. It's, they're warm to sit in front of, but they, you know, give CO2 and carbon monoxide to use this to dry out your house it just makes it worse because when you burn a fossil fuel um yeah that's one of the byproducts it's water so it just makes it more moist inside your house so yeah i think that's about it we're two minutes over we got some questions um haven't seen any come in from the chat if you guys have any please ask but we'll answer these ones external insulation dew point interstitial moisture versus air tightness i'm not sure what the question is but um, if you use external insulation, generally you're keeping all the inter interior surfaces warm. Therefore, you don't really get the dew point and interstitial condensation moisture situation as a problem. And when you're using external insulation, you're usually putting a membrane to get that air tightness. And so if you have air tightness, you need ventilation to make sure that you don't have um, excess moisture and stuff like that. And you also want to help people breathe. But uh, yeah, so external insulation is great, but definitely need some ventilation with it as well. The model method for architects, do you know what that is, Denise? Any way to answer that? I'm not really sure. Is it uh, regarding H1 verification for, yes, go for it. Yeah. Thermal modeling, energy modeling is the way forward. Don't use schedule and yeah. compliance oh, method, okay. Cut out. calculation um, method. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, don't use schedule yeah. or calculation method, just modeling. Yeah. Yeah, because schedule and calculation method, they just, they're shots in the dark. They're kind of guesses. Um, whereas modeling, if you use PHPP, if you do like a basic, um, basic uh, passive house course, you'll learn how to do the modeling. It's pretty simple. You draw it up in... Um, draw it up in SketchUp and then model it out. And then you can actually figure out and how much energy you're using. And to get to the last question, alterations, mm. renovations, all doable with energy modeling. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure why doable. modeling wouldn't be an option, but like when you take in, when you take your pants in um, for alterations, you still put the pants on and you model them and they measure them. And it's like, it's the same thing with a building. Even yeah. if it's an alteration, you can still draw out the model and then figure out what that's all what, That's what this is about, this house and inner fit. 
that's like passive house um, renovation. So you can totally take an existing building and model yeah. it for H1, passive house, you name it, we do it. Yeah, sometimes it's a little <laughs> bit more complicated. You might have to rip open some walls to see what, what they're built out of um, and figure out where this beam is going and where this duct is going and all that. But, you know, it's all doable. You just uh, you just got to get the, the input. So I think that's it, guys. We're five minutes over. Thanks for joining. If you have any more questions, please feel free to send them through. If you want to yell them at us, you can. Um, but if not, yeah, then... Yeah, come and see us next month for yeah. thermal bridging. Yeah, that'll be a the fun next, one. The next thing that will eventually be addressed in H1. Yeah. Not in this round. Nah. But... Yeah. If Next you want some more information, that's our Instagram page. Lots of fun stuff on there. We have, we're on LinkedIn. We have our website. We have our H1 page, resources, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, feel free. And our next one is going to be on the 29th of September. So thanks very much for joining. Um, we'll be posting this online on YouTube in case you missed it or missed something. Or if you have a friend who wanted to see this and didn't see it, then yeah, we'll have it on our YouTube. So 